Uh, the reading this morning uh, is from Habakkuk. So if you don't know where that is, it's about two-thirds of the way through the Bible, um, just towards the end of the Old Testament uh, section. Um, and if you're following it in the Church Bibles, it can be found on page 906. And I'm going to be reading from uh, the first chapter of Habakkuk uh, and a selection of verses. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack, and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. Look at the nations and see. Be astonished, be astounded, for a work is being done in your days that you would not believe if you were told. For I am arousing the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They all come for violence, with faces pressing forward. They gather captives like sand. Then they sweep by like the wind. They transgress and become guilty. Their own might is their God. Are you not from of old, O Lord my God, my Holy One? You shall not die. O Lord, you have marked them for judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them them for punishment. Your eyes are too pure to behold evil, and you cannot look on wrongdoing. Why do you look on the treacherous and are silent when the wicked swallow those more righteous than they? You have made people like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. The enemy brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his sane. So he rejoices and exults. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and destroying the nations without mercy? Thank you for that reading. The passion, the pain, the prayer, the protest. And no, we're not talking about England rugby. We are talking about a major question from a minor prophet tucked into the end of the Old Testament that has so much to teach us today. I don't know if you're able to catch some of the the uh, text from that fantastic uh, little video that was put together. Habakkuk was a temple prophet in the time of uh, the last years of the nation of Jerusalem, uh, the sort of southern kingdom of Israel, based in Jerusalem. And the king uh, was a pretty weak king at that time. Basically, the country's fortunes were going from bad to worst. Jeremiah, one of the great old prophets, was saying, don't do this, uh, do that. And they were just disregarding him. And Habakkuk is working in the temple as a a sort of one of the temple officials, a paid prophet, if you like. And he prophesies, but not telling the people what to do, but he sort of brings the angst to the people to God. And not actually in just a great big splurge, but in a beautifully composed oracle, it says. An oracle, it was a form of lament, a poem of lament, crafted, it doesn't come across in translation, but crafted in Hebrew to bring this pain to God. And uh, the other word for oracle, interestingly, in that Hebrew, it's the same as burden. And it's something that you carry to God as a prayer. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. 
He was writing just before the nation was going to be invaded by the Chaldeans from Babylon, modern-day Iraq, and taken off into exile for 70 years. He knew it was going to be grim. It wasn't an easy time for uh, the nation. And he was at some sort of pain and grief to work it all out himself. Why was this happening? How long shall I cry to help and you will not listen? Or cry violence and you will not save? Sometimes in life, there are no easy answers. And you feel desperate and you cry out, how long, O oh God? And if you have the sort of faith that depends upon quick and easy answers, then it's highly likely that you'll give up the journey. Because it just doesn't fit together and it's just too painful. But Habakkuk, in fact, doubled his pain because he held on to these questions and struggled with them at the same time holding on to his faith in God. He was called to love the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind and his, all his strength. And every one of those aspects of his prayer walk were challenged. His, his heart was broken. His soul struggled. His strength failed him, as we see later on in uh, chapter 3. And his mind was just questioning God in whom he believed. The God he knew his, was his only hope. And yet, why and how and how long? I'm sure his prayer resonates with us today. I'm sure it does. Here in All Saints, we share among us pain and loss and difficulties that are not resolved. All of us experience this. And we've just been hearing this morning of the work going on uh, for those in the Calais jungle, the refugee situation. We have a world that is struggling in pain. And if I was living in Africa right now, um, with my crops devastated in the east of Africa, with locusts having already been weakened by drought, I'd be saying, how long, O oh Lord? Why is this happening? Now, Habakkuk was upset by the failings of his own people. His, old, his own king was uh, pretty weak and not really listening. And... Uh, and we can get upset by things close to home, can't we? Our own people, e each other. You know, the Brexit wrangles, the, the lack of truth in public discourse, or indeed the many shortcomings that are frequently in the papers of our church and its leaders. And we might say, how long, O Lord? Sister Wendy Beckett once said that watching the news comes with an awesome responsibility. And if you think how much we see the news, that's a huge responsibility. The responsibility to pray about what we see. Because as Christians, we are called to feel the pain of the world and to pray, to lift it to God. And that's our first lesson from Habakkuk, to, to pray to lift the pain that we're experiencing, the pain of the world, to God. It's right to be concerned about these things. And amongst us in All Saints, we have our refugee action, we have people concerned for the homeless in Wickham, we have teachers trying to teach and, and bring God's light to our young people across the area. We have business people who are struggling to conduct uh, their businesses ethically in a way that doesn't compromise God's will for creation. Many different uh, outlets of concern and prayer and pain that we are representing as a body together. And it's right that we should be, in different ways, bringing these prayers to God. But secondly, Habakkuk teaches us not only to bring our pain to God, 
but to protest to him, to protest. In verses 5 to 11, God's reply to him about how long it's all going to be is basically saying, be careful what you wish for. My instrument of judgment will be the invasion of the Babylonian forces, which will take away the Jewish people and actually make things even worse for a while. That's rather like um, modern-day Iraqis having got through the horrors of Saddam Hussein's rule, suddenly facing ISIS marching through their country. And Habakkuk himself could not understand how the God that he worshipped could even tolerate such evil. He says in verse 13, your eyes are too pure to behold evil. You can't look on wrongdoing. Why do you look on the treacherous and are silent when the wicked swallow those more righteous than they? Why do good people suffer, in other words? How can you tolerate that, God? Just before we came out this morning, I was listening to a lady on the radio, um, a lovely Christian lady who'd lost her sister in a tragic accident, a road accident in France, and, uh, and two others as well. And that little group of people in the car were the leaders of um, something called Arosha, which is, is a leading Christian ecological movement that has done so much to promote saving the planet, essentially, and, and to, to teach us as, as Christians how to respond to that. And they were killed in an accident, and she was, she'd lost her sister. She was devastated. How can good things, bad things, happen to good people? And Habakkuk goes on to say, uh, those Chaldeans, they would gather up God's people like a heap of sand. And that use of that word sand there, um, if if you uh, remember the promise to Abraham, your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky and the sand in the sea. It seems like God's very promise to the descendants of Abraham was in reverse God was forgetting it. And so his questions led Habakkuk to protest. It's not fair, it doesn't seem to fit. Why the wicked, even glorifying in their own strength, metaphorically um, emptying their nets of fish and destroying the nations without mercy, he asks. And this is the classic question asked down the centuries. How can a good God coexist with evil? It was a cry taken up from time to time uh, around Jesus' time with the um, occupation of Rome in Palestine. It could well be on the mouths of uh, Poles in Europe when uh, the Nazis left and the Soviets took over. How could all this happen? And actually, uh, as perhaps the winds swirling around us suggest, chapter one, I'm afraid, does end on a rather bleak note. That's where it ends. It's a question. There are no answers in chapter one. We need to wait till chapter two and chapter three to see how it's worked through. But it's not an easy passage. There are no glib answers. Jesus on the cross cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the anguish of unknowing. And if there are any who who are here today who are perhaps struggling with faith in God or, or for whom it's a barrier even to come to God and become a Christian in the first place, then we need to recognize that God takes this pain through Jesus on the cross into his very heart and he understands it. He knows what it's like to be rejected and to encounter the unfathomable mysteries of providence. We are called to bring our own pain and the pain of the world to God. We are also called to protest. That protest of Habakkuk was God's inspiration. He needed to wrestle with it. And we need to wrestle with these things. But we also have that invitation, that burden, the word that we first started with, that burden that we need to drop at the foot of the cross when Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. And so that's where we'll leave it today. 
More to be picked up next week. <laughs>